Presented by Caltech. So thank you. It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Greg Hallinan. We're very lucky in astronomy to have a number of uh, relatively young, uh, energetic faculty members. And uh, Greg joined us in 2012. Now, astronomer, he's an astronomer, a radio astronomer. And uh, astronomers have different uh, characteristics. Some are observers. So they use telescopes other people have built, and they take new ways to use these telescopes to observe the heavens and learn new things. Others are technologists. They go into their labs. They develop state-of-the-art detectors. I like to characterize Greg as an entrepreneur. So Greg takes a creative idea for building a new kind of uh, radio telescope, but he brings together people, engineers from all different uh, disciplines, scientists, people who know how to deal with big data, and he gets them all moving in the same direction, and he says, but you have to do it for 10% of the cost that, that you think you can do it for. <laughs> right. So uh, Greg is going to tell you tonight about chasing extrasolar space weather with an array that he has been uh, working on at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. Now, as soon as Greg starts to talk, you'll realize that he grew up in Ireland. Uh, he got his PhD at the Center for Astronomy at the National University of Ireland in Galway. He then went uh, on with a prestigious Jansky, Jansky Fellowship to the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, we convinced him to come to Caltech in uh, 2012. And since then, he's been awarded a Sloan Fellowship, which is quite an honor. Uh, and I asked Greg, is there anything particularly interesting or unusual you'd like me to uh, say about you know, your experience at Caltech? And he said, well, he feels like the victim of endless opportunities that are available here in a unique place like Caltech. And so in addition to this work that he's going to tell you about that you'd think could already fill a career, he has been building an optical instrument for the Palomar Optical Telescope and uh, leading a large survey for transients at the premier radio facility, the very large array in Socorro, New Mexico. So without further ado, please welcome Greg Hallinan. Good evening, and thank you, Fiona, for that generous introduction. OK, um, I'm here to talk about my favorite topic, which is extrasolar space weather. Pretty new field. So let's start off somewhere a bit more local and talk about the space weather in our own solar system. Here is an object that most residents of Pasadena are very familiar with. It's the sun, uh, a big giant ball of plasma, ionized gas, a million kilometers across. This is an image taken this morning with the Solar Dynamics Observatory in Earth orbit which shows that in invisible light, as we know, the sun is largely featureless. It's featureless apart from these little black dots here. These are called sunspots. And sunspots are just one manifestation of magnetic fields on the sun. And I'm going to talk about how magnetic fields impact the sun and other stars. So how are magnetic fields generated in the sun? Well, it's a big giant ball of plasma of ionized gas. It rotates about once a month. And that generates a current. And as is the case for an electromagnet, when you generate a current, you get a magnetic field. In the, Earth's in the sun's case, however, the layers of the sun rotate at different speeds, such that those magnetic field lines get dragged around the sun, kind of like an elastic band being dragged around a tennis ball, getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. The outer layers of the sun is convective. They, you've got lots of turbulence. And that kind of disturbs that magnetic field, drags some of it to the surface, and that breaks out as, sun, as sunspots. Those sunspots are darker than the rest of the sun because the way energy uh, is transported to the out, outer layers of the sun is via convection, and those magnetic fields kind of suppress that convection. 
So uh, the oceanic fields are responsible for a lot of things in the sun. A very famous quote from Robert Layton at Caltech many years ago was, the sun, if the sun did not have a magnetic field, it would be as interesting a, a star as most astronomers think it is. Happily for uh, astronomers on the Earth who, who are interested in solar science, it has a magnetic field, and it makes things very exciting. Those magnetic fields heat the outer atmosphere of the sun to a very high temperature, a million degrees Kelvin, whereas the outer, the outer uh, photosphere is only 6,000 Kelvin. We do not fully understand yet how the sun does that, although we have some ideas. It's also responsible for, for generating a, a stream of particles that is uh, accelerated outwards towards the planet, planets at high energy called the solar wind. So uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of phenomena that are very important for our, our local space environment. And they're caused by the magnetic fields of the sun. One are solar flares. Uh, as you can see, those magnetic loops kind of breach through the surface, causing sunspots. But typically, they're, they're, they're of opposite polarity. If they, uh, they're getting dragged around by the plasma of the sun, and uh, very often, you can have uh, uh, field lines of opposite polarity coming together. And that's called magnetic reconnection. And that can dump a huge amount of energy into the, uh, the plasma of the sun. Kind of like when that, that, that uh, elastic band you wrapped around the tennis ball breaks. You've got a, a, a lot of uh, potential energy getting dumped to kinetic energy. And that can produce a, a tremendous amount of x-rays, extreme ultraviolet, and so forth. A second phenomena, a phenomenon is called a coronal mass ejection. And that's when uh, a big ball of plasma is expelled from the sun at high velocity. I'm talking a trillion tons, a, a bubble of plasma getting, getting thrown out towards the planets. And both those phenomena are what define the space weather uh, around the Earth. So previously, we looked at the sun at optical wavelengths with the Solar Dynamics Obser Observatory. If it was possible to put on a pair of glasses for extreme ultraviolet and X-ray, X-rays, the sun become a very exciting objects, object. Around where you have those spots, you have flares. That's those uh, magnetic reconnection events that happen where you have a lot of energy converted to X-rays and extreme ultraviolet. And in addition, you have those coronal mass ejections, those bubbles of plasma being thrown out at high energies uh, out towards the planets, and in some cases, away from the planets. And that's a, a very important point. Each one of those coronal mass ejections has its own characteristic direction. And uh, most of my talk is, is going to focus on these coronal mass ejections, their impact on the planets in our solar system, and really, more importantly, what's the impact on other planets orbiting other stars. So let's uh, stick uh, to, to the, uh, the solar case for another few minutes, looking now at what happens when a, so when a coronal mass ejection is directed towards the Earth. So you have this extra bubble of plasma thrown into the solar wind that impacts the Earth happily the Earth has a magnetic field of its own. It gets compressed, it reconnects, and then you've got material accelerated down into the polar regions. And that gives you the beautiful aurora. And what the aurora are are just another example of how our space weather is impacted by the sun. When you have a major coronal mass ejection impact the Earth, you have a geomagnetic storm. You may have aurora as far south as you know, uh, northern US. And in some extreme cases, much, 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 much further south than that again, too. So uh, those aurora are an example of an effect of the uh, solar wind, of coronal mass ejections. Uh, it's a geomagnetic storm. There are some negative repercussions. Uh, there's danger to any satellites in space at that time, any astronauts. Uh, probably, most importantly, it impacts communication on the ground. It impacts the use of GPS satellites. And in some cases, it can actually damage power grids. So how often do these coronal mass ejections occur? So the activity of the sun follows a cycle. Every 11 years, it waxes and wanes. There's, very, there's various metrics that are used to try and quantify whether this, the solar activity cycle is in a maximum or a minimum, one example being how many spots there are on the surface. And that follows its characteristic pattern of an 11-year cycle. Right now, we're just passing out of the maximum of a cycle. It was actually quite a small peak, and uh, uh, we've just passed through it. If you look at the number of coronal mass ejections per day over the, uh, the last uh, couple of cycles, you'll see that you, during the peak, you have multiple coronal mass ejections per day. During the minima, it might be one per, per week, or as low as that. However, only some of those coronal mass ejections are directed towards the Earth. 
So uh, here's an example of an observation of coronal mass ejections. Uh, how, it's, how they're typically observed from the ground or from space is by using a chronograph to block out the extremely bright light from the, from the sun. Uh, the light from the sun gets scattered off the high energy, uh, high energy corona, and you can trace, you can see the resulting emission as, uh, as uh, uh, the example we see here. So here's an example of a coronal mass ejection on the limb of the sun, not in our direction. Here's an example of what we call a halo CME. As you can see, it looks like a bubble uh, leaving the, the entirety of the sun. That's because it's traveling in our direction. They're the ones we want to worry about. They're the ones that can impact our space environment. So uh, this plot shows, uh, once again, the, the various solar cycles over the last 50 years, and how often you had a disturbance caused by a geomagnetic storm, by a coronal mass ejection impacting the Earth's magnetosphere. Each of those black lines corresponds to a geomagnetic storm. Some are more severe than others. In the last solar cycle, we had less than 10 geomagnetic storms, so only a very small fraction cause those kind of events. They have to, be, have to be large enough, pointed in the right direction, and also the magnetic field in the coronal mass ejection has to be in opposite orientation to the Earth's magnetic field to cause that reconnection event. You can see over the last uh, 50 years, a couple of event, events were a bit, bit larger than others. Here, for example, are the famous uh, solar storms in, around the Halloween 2003. This event here is very notably large. 1989 is by far the outstanding geomagnetic storm. During that event, uh, there was actually a power outage in the, in the uh, northeast US caused by power loss at the uh, Hydro Dam in Quebec. Nine hours without power for a substantial amount of the northeastern seaboard, caused by the uh, excess current being, being sent into transformers that were essentially overpowered. And uh, uh, there was essentially melting of critical components, and they lost critical power. And that, you know, is the major worry with these events, that they can actually damage the power grid. So how large can these events get? We have data for a few hundred years. We do know of one event in 1859 called the Carrington Flare, or Carrington Event. It was an enormous geomagnetic storm. Here's a, a famous painting by uh, Frederick Evan Church, called Aurora Borealis a few years after the event that some speculate may have been motivated by that event. How large was that solar storm? Uh, going back to this scale, we see that most storms are between about 100 and about 400. One event drops down to about minus 600 nanotesla. This is what we call the disturbance storm time index. It's a measurement of how impactful it is on the Earth's magnetic field. This event was minus 1760 nanotesla on that scale. So enormous. There have been studies done of what would be the economic impact of that event. And it's estimated about two trillion. You could lose the power grid in the US for a month if that happened. Happily, it's a once in a 500 year event. Happily. Here is an example of what, this is a model that shows the impact on the Earth's magnetosphere for that event. You see huge compression, and that explains how the excess current occurs in the magnetosphere. I mentioned it's a one in a 500 year event. That's not to say we don't have close calls. In 2012, this happened, an enormous coronal mass ejection. This particular image was taken by a satellite uh, called Stereo. There's actually two of them uh, that are in training and, 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 and leading Earth orbit that can image coronal mass ejections in 3D to try and understand how they impact the Earth. This event was similar in scale to the Carrington event. It missed us by one week. If the Earth was a week slower in its rotation, it would have hit us. And that's kind of uh, demonstrated here by this model, which shows there's a bunch of smaller events as the sun rotates, and then you've got one event and then one enormous event, and that was the, uh, the CME that missed us. So now I want to step back. What is the impact of this kind of activity on longer time scales? Sure, it can have economic impact of a couple of trillion, but you know, that's century-long kind of ramifications rather than uh, uh, global ramifications on longer time scales. Here are three very familiar planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. As we all know, Earth lies in the habitable zone of the sun. What is that? It's the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just right for liquid water. As it happens, Mars is pretty close. And by some definitions, it's right on the edge. Venus is too close. What kind of effect 
does those, do these coronal mass ejections have on the sun across you know, cosmological time? Our sun's four and a half billion years old. What happens when you, com you know, continuously bombard planets with those kind of events? It turns out it has a huge impact. We now know that Mars used to have an atmosphere, it used to have a reasonably large amount of water in its atmosphere, and it lost that water and lost that atmosphere due to coronal mass ejections from the sun. We know that Venus used to have a lot of water in its atmosphere. It still has a thick atmosphere, but it's lost its water. Earth is in between. Why did it survive? It survived because it has a magnetic field, a shield against that activity. And that's really, that may be really, really important now for defining habitability in a new way. Maybe it's not just liquid water. Maybe you need to have the right kind of uh, interior and the right kind of star and the right kind of planet in order to, be, to have habitability. Uh, what's very interesting is that Mars used to have a magnetic field, but lost it. Venus, as far as we can tell, never had a magnetic field. So we don't really understand, we don't, we know, we've got many theories, but we don't very well understand uh, why the dynamos in these planets are differing from object to object. And I want to ask the question, uh, what happens when you're around different stars, young stars, and so forth? For example, uh, I mentioned our sun as being a, you know, a, big ball of plasma, but it's also a middle-aged star. It's four and a half billion years old. Uh, it's, it's in its middle ages. It turns out when it was much younger, it was much more active. Like a petulant child, it, it was much more, it flared a lot more, it had a thousand times more x-rays, and that critical period when the, when the sun was young may have been very impactful on why Mars actually uh, lost its atmosphere. Uh, that critical period just when the, the star is, is, uh, is uh, onto the main sequence. Over time, the sun sl slowed down. What actually, what actually powered the magnetic fields, I mentioned this kind of analogy of uh, electromagnet, is, is the rotation. If you have a star rotating much faster, it will have much stronger fields. And the sun, when it was young, rotated very fast. Uh, by uh, losing its solar wind, by losing angular momentum, eventually it slowed down to become the middle-aged, well-behaved star that we now know. Uh, we had a stunning example recently, a uh, confirmation rather, of, of how this situation affected Mars. The MAVEN satellite directly measured oxygen loss at Mars and, real, and con confirmed that it was much higher than expected, actually. And in a series of very nice papers in science, revealed that, you know, this confirmed rather that the sun did in fact erode the atmosphere of Mars billions of years ago. So now let's uh, step back out of our solar system, beyond the planets, beyond planet nine, Keep going further and further, out to, out to a few parsecs, and look back towards the sun. What we see is uh, uh, a nice population of stars in the solar neighborhood. So you very often see the sun described as an average star. I disagree. It's, a, it's not an average star. It's a bigger than average star. These yellow stars here are kind of analogs of the sun. They're what we call G-dwarfs. These blue stars are hotter, but all these orange and red stars, well, they're fainter, they're cooler, and they're lower mass. As you can see, the sun is a bigger than average star. Let me break it down in a bit more, uh, quanti uh, in more quantitative fashion. Here is the number of G dwarfs out to a distance of about eight parsecs. That's right in the, uh, the solar neighborhood, out to about 250 uh, trillion kilometers, so really close by uh, on astronomical uh, 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 scenario. Uh, and what we see is that there's only eight G dwarfs and a mass of 157 of these, these, these objects here. These are what we call M dwarfs. Small red stars, and it's these stars that dominate the stellar population. What's been very exciting in recent years is that M dwarfs have been found to be very populous with small rocky planets. This is work done by uh, a postdoc uh, now at Caltech as a Sagan fellow, Courtney Dressing, uh, with, uh, uh, with Dave Charbonneau. They've shown by using Kepler, uh, Kepler was this wonderful space mission that's ongoing, uh, to search for planets around, uh, around stars through transit, what, what Kepler has shown is that M dwarfs have lots of small rocky planets. And by our standard definition of the habitable zone, whether or not it can support liquid water, um, it has lots of habitable planets. So much so that the nearest habitable planet orbits an M dwarf at 2.6 parsecs, plus or minus 0.4 parsecs, statistically calculated. We don't actually know where, which, which star has that yet because we haven't found those planets orbiting those nearby M dwarfs. That's a big focus for the next big space mission called TESS that will look for those planets. So going back to this list, a bunch of these M dwarfs 
have small rocky planets that may be in the habitable zone of those, of those uh, stars. However, what about magnetic activity? How does magnetic activity change as you go from, smaller, from larger stars to smaller stars? Can we detect stellar flares? Can we de detect coronal mass ejections on these stars? And most important, can we detect for the first time whether or not other planets have magnetic fields? I begin to understand more, more carefully what actually governs whether or not planets have magnetic fields. So if we, we now know of about 2,000 planets. It's time to start answering those questions. So uh, we can answer, I can answer one of those questions categorically. We can measure flares from other stars. That's the burst of high-energy radiation you get when you have that reconnection event. Not the shock wave you get from a CME, but it is the flare. It turns out you can measure flares on nearby stars with small telescopes. That's because a lot of stars flare much, much, much brighter than the sun does because they're young stars. But it also turns out that M dwarfs flare quite a lot. Here is an example comparing a flare on the sun with a small M dwarf called GGCVN. Uh, this little M dwarf, which only has uh, 0.3 the radius, uh, times the radius of the sun, a luminosity only 1,000 of the sun, and a mass about 0.3 that of the sun, this small object, about 18 parsecs away, uh, produced an enormous flare in April 2014. It was so large that there's a telescope in space called SWIFT. It's built to detect gamma ray bursts, the biggest explosions in the universe. So it sees a large fraction of the sky and tries to detect that. The flare on this small little star was so huge, it triggered SWIFT. It thought it was a GRB. That's how powerful it was. I'm going to try and compare directly now the flare on DGCVN with the, lar the largest flare we've ever, we've ever seen in the sun. Using the standard you know, scale for measuring flares, which goes A, B, C, M, X, each class uh, a factor of 10 larger than, than the next. So here now is a comparison of the biggest event we've ever seen from the sun, the biggest flare, that is, in 2003. There it was, X45. How large was the flare from DG Canven? X100,000. 200,000 times larger than any flare we've seen uh, uh, from the sun. Now, it's worth noting, however, that maybe this was a, an, a, just an unusual event because it's a, young, it's a young star. And when the sun was young, it had those kind of large, the sun had those kind of huge flares also. However, there's more to the tale. The impact of that flare is bigger than you'd think. This is, what, this is now, now defining the habitable zone for stars as a function of uh, how, how hot they are and distance. Up here we have the Earth, uh, at 1 AU, an astronomical unit being the, the distance between the, between the sun and the Earth. Because it has a luminosity 1,000 that of the sun, these small M dwarves have a habitable zone that's much closer. So that flare that was 2,000 200, 200, times larger than the sun's biggest flare was magnified by an enormous amount because the planet was so much closer if it was in the habitable zone. Now, I mentioned it was a young star. Perhaps these M dwarves you know, slow down after you know, 50 million years, same way the sun did. And unfortunately, that's not the case. This now shows the time it takes for a star to slow down, to spin down, lose its kind of angular momentum, and stop being, you know, that petulant child, stop being very active. The star I showed you is M4. It has that behavior for giga years. Essentially, the entire duration of the sun's life, it would be doing this kind of activity. So that's a pretty spectacular uh, uh, situation. So those, uh, those flares clearly have a large impact. We can, we can quantify that very well. What we don't know is what happens when those flares happen. Is there a coronal mass ejection? And that's the more important question. In our own solar system, it's the coronal mass ejection that defines whether or not Mars lost its atmosphere. We can measure flares very easily. It turns out we've never been able to measure any coronal mass ejection from a star other than the, uh, than the uh, sun. And more, more importantly, again, we've never been able to measure directly whether or not a planet has a magnetic field. And that's pretty important. Here now I'm showing the magnetic field of the sun. Uh, this on the right hand side is a measurement of the magnetic field of an M dwarf. It is completely different to the sun. It's got this large dipolar shape, kind of like the Earth's does, except way stronger. What happens when a coronal mass ejection happens on that star? Maybe it doesn't get thrown out towards the planet. Because it's so strong, the magnetic field might funnel it up towards the rotation poles and away from the star. 
They're the kind of questions we want to be able to, to, to answer. How often do M dwarves have CMEs? And what directions do they get, get funneled? Uh, and, and, and the real global question one we want to answer now is wh whether or not CMEs on other stars like M dwarves might redefine habitability. This is a wonderful animation that we, we got done as part of a, a, a KISS workshop on uh, planetary habitability as a function of negativity. And it shows that around an M dwarf, we want to ask the question whether or not having a magnetic field may be what defines habitability for small rocky planets around those stars. So how do we remotely sense coronal mass ejections? Flares are easy, but coronal mass ejections are hard. We measure them on the sun by looking at uh, these coronagraphs that block the light of the, of the sun. We can't use that for nearby stars. It's impossible. Uh, it's been used in the sun for the last 40 years, uh, uh, since it's the early 70s, with the orbiting solar observer and Skylab were able to detect these events for the first time. It turns out there was another signature. It's radio waves. When, when, a, when, a, uh, a, this, when the sun has a big coronal mass ejection, it produces a very bright radio burst, and it has a very characteristic signature. This complicated plot shows what actually we see. It's intensely bright, but looking at frequency and time, you see here it's a few hundred megahertz radio frequencies. It lasts for minutes. What we see is a characteristic burst that sweeps from uh, high to low frequencies. What we're seeing, actually, that frequency corresponds to the density of the bubble as it passes out. So as you go from high to lower frequencies, you're tracing the bubble passing outwards, the shock wave propagating outwards. And that allows you to measure the density of that shock wave. It allows you to measure the velocity of that coronal mass ejection. It's really useful information. And it turns out the coronal mass ejection phenomena was, was, was discovered in the early 70s. But through radio waves, they had actually been discovered 30 years earlier. Uh, radio astronomy really kicked off in the post-World War II era, when lots of radar uh, specialists, engineers, you know, decided to turn their, their equipment towards, towards the skies. This is actually the first woman radio astronomer, Ruby Payne Scott. And she discovered the first of these bursts, these type two radio bursts. Whenever you've got a very large coronal mass ejection, you get a, a type two burst. And she discovered an enormous one. In 1947, this burst went off. It was so bright that if you were looking at the Earth from a distance of a few parsecs and pointed your telescope at the uh, sun at the right time, you'd detect this radio burst. And you'd say, right, this star just happened to have a coronal mass ejection. However, this kind of a massive event is very rare. So how do you try and capture those kind of events on other stars? For the sun, it's easy. We've got a whole suite of space telescopes and ground telescopes that observe the sun. But how do you try and find those on other stars? And what about the planets? How do we measure magnetic fields and planets? It turns out by a very similar means. The sun's a bright radio source when it flares. And similarly, when a planet has an aurora, it turns into a bright radio source. This was first discovered in 1955 by two famous radio astronomers, Bernard Burke and Kenny Fra uh, Kenneth Franklin, when they, were, they built this Mills Cross Array uh, to try and map uh, extragalactic sources. And they found a really bright burst in source of interference. They weren't sure what it was. Initially, they thought it was a, a farmhand driving home from a date, and his tractor was kind of misfiring. And, they thought that was actually the cause of, the, of this, uh, this, this kind of interference they were seeing. But eventually, they figured out, hang on, it's moving with the sky, and it's in the direction of Jupiter. And they figured out it was Jupiter. It was very important. It was the very first time that they were able to establish that Jupiter had a magnetic field. It was also the first time they established what was the correct rotation rate of Jupiter. If you look at the cloud bands of Jupiter, they all rotate at different speeds. But the magnetic field is anchored to the core and has a very fixed period. And they can measure that for the first time. So now I'm going to play some radio data. This is a very common misconception about how radio astronomy happens uh, from the movie Contact. <laughs> radio waves are electromagnetic radiation, right? So we don't really listen to them. We make images in the standard way you make images with, with an optical telescope. However, for public talks, it's possible to do some you know, playing around and actually listen to what, we're, what, we, what we see. And in the case of Jupiter and the, and the other planets, it turns out the radio waves are pretty, uh, pretty cool to listen to. They've got a very characteristic signature. So let's go back to Jupiter now. I'm going to play some of the bursts you can detect from Jupiter. Jupiter is so bright, you can build a dipole in your back garden. and It's so intensely bright. <laughs> 
So first off is the type of burst we call a long burst. If I can find, here we go. And this is kind of uh, said to be reminiscent of waves lapping on the seashore. Next up, we have short bursts, S bursts. I actually need to turn off this guy first. Bear with me. Now, these S bursts are, made, are said to sound like popcorn popping. S bursts. Like I said, a small dipole in your backyard, and you can pick this up. If you slow it down, though, it sounds a little more exciting. Here it is now sl substantially slowed down. The whistler waves, as the, the radio emission changes the function of time and frequency. It it's kind of sweeps through the dynamic uh, spectrum plane. So that was the Jupiter in, in 55. Turns out the Earth's also a very bright radio source. However, we didn't discover that until the mid-60s, because the radio emission from the, from the Earth is at such a low radio frequency that it can't actually get through our atmosphere. Our, our ionosphere blocks it. So it wasn't until we sent up satellites into the auroral zones of the Earth that it turns out we could find those radio waves. Once again, in the auroral region of the Earth, you get this bright radio emission, and it's intensely bright. Uh, it's 10,000 times brighter than any man-made signal. Uh, this one sounds much more exotic again. I, I had a, a former postdoc, Leon Harding, who, who kind of made the analogy that it sounds something like, a, like, like uh, you'd hear from the movie Transformers. So here we go. That is the noise, the sound of the Earth's auroral radio waves. So it turns out all the planets in our solar system that have a magnetic field produce those radio waves. Um, Voyagers, the wonderful Voyager missions, when they flew by the outer gas giant planets, found the same kind of radio waves. And it turns out, in all cases, they're very, very bright, very intense, but the frequency of the radio emission was very important. Here now is a plot, a very busy plot, but it shows frequency and how powerful the radio emission is. And it's intensely powerful. Here's the Jupiter radio emission. And it cuts off at about 40 megahertz. 40 megahertz is just drops like a stone. If you have a dipole at 38 megahertz, you can pick it up. If you have the VLA, the biggest telescope in the world in radio, at 55, nada. OK, it just drops like a stone. And why that is is because the auroral radio emission is producing them in the magnetic fields of the planet. But it cuts off at the, at the top of the atmosphere. And the frequency tells you how strong the magnetic field is. All the other planets have weaker fields. So like I mentioned, Earth's radio emission is about a megahertz, which is below the cutoff from where you can observe it from the ground, which is why you know, the satellites discovered the Earth's radio emission and Voyager found the rest of it. Now, what about extrasolar planets? Can we detect these radio waves from other planets? If we do, it'd be amazing, because now we can measure a magnetic field of planets, exoplanets, but for the first time. Instead of having eight planets, we'd have a large population to start figuring out questions about why and when a planet has a magnetic field and how that redefines habitability. It also allows you to measure rotation rate. So it turns out the radio waves of Jupiter is beamed like a lighthouse. It blasts us once per rotation period. It's like a pulsar before pulsars were discovered. And this tells you how, what well, the rotation rate is. And of course, it also provides insight into internal structure. I mentioned to give you a dynamo, you had to have the current. You can't have a current if you haven't got a molten core. So it tells you something about the planet's interior. And maybe, maybe, it might be a future way to detect, detect exoplanets. So I mentioned Jupiter is very, very tremendously bright. But it's 4.5 AU away. If you go out to even 5 parsecs, which is very nearby, that becomes a million AU. That's pretty, that's pretty far. But and it turns out, if you try to do the calculation, that no telescope we currently have can detect Jupiter. However, it turns out the radial luminosity of the planet strongly depends on how close it is to the star. And that makes sense. The more intense the stellar wind, 
the stronger the radio waves. And it goes as a square or the inverse square of the distance. So if you push a planet in close to its parent star, suddenly it could become a much brighter radio source. And we know of a whole population of planets, including, for example, hot Jupiter, Jupiters that are very close to the parent star. And we haven't found any radio emission from planets yet, but it turns out we have found the exact same kind of phenomenon on a different kind of object. So these are brown dwarfs. Brown dwarfs are the missing link between stars and planets. They're too small, too low mass, to sustain the hydrogen fusion that powers stars, and they're too big to be planets. They're the missing link. They're the glowing embers of the, of the galaxy. So they lie in between stars and planets, and you might ask whether they behave like a star or a planet in terms of their negativity. Maybe they have a corona, and they have flares and coronal mass ejections. Or maybe they have a big dipole, and they have aurora. And we've actually established that, in fact, they do have aurora. Initially, uh, the first detection of radio waves from Brown Dwarf was done by a group of students led by a Celtic student in 2001. When I was a graduate student, I observed a bunch of these objects, and I discovered that they pulse. This guy here is a Brown Dwarf. And this now is what radio data really looks like. It's an image. And this, this guy here is a Brown Dwarf. And what actually happens is that Brown Dwarf is pulsing. Every couple of hours, blam, a blast of radiation. And it turns out that that radio emission is the exact same as what we see from Jupiter, but souped up by a factor of a million, much more powerful. Uh, earlier this year, we kind of did some follow-up observations, or sorry, last couple of years, we've been doing observations of a bunch of these brown dwarfs using both the VLA, this very large radio array telescope in New Mexico, and the Keck telescopes in uh, Hawaii, because now we know it's got radio aurora, maybe we can see the optical aurora. And sure enough, we did. This is a paper published in Nature in, in, in uh, uh, July of 2015, which showed that you do indeed have this beautiful radio aurora that periodically blasts in the direction of Earth, and a corresponding optical aurora. And that really told us a very important uh, thing, that the kind of solar-like activity we see where you've got flares and coronal mass ejections, that disappears. And by the time you get to brown dwarfs, it's morphed into the more planet-like aurora we see from, from Jupiter and other planets, just much more powerful. It also tells us that, it, that this kind of phenomenon on, on exoplanets can be detected at much higher energies if you find the right planet. You see this kind of uh, Earth's impression we have here. The aurora is red because uh, the Earth's atmosphere, the green aurora, is caused primarily by oxygen and also nitrogen. This brown dwarf has a largely hydrogen atmosphere, so you've got hydrogen lines that happen to be red. So this program is continuing, and it's kind of allowing us to bridge the gap from brown dwarfs right down into planets and give us a guiding clue about how the magnetic fields of, of planets might behave. Um, there's two graduate students at Caltech who are now separately trying to focus on ever cooler brown dwarfs. Melody Cow is focusing on trying to detect cooler and cooler brown dwarfs in the radio. And Sebastian Pineda is doing the same with Keck telescopes and are uncovering new populations of these objects that are benchmarks in our march to try and find uh, planets from magnetic uh, uh, fields and extrasolar planets. So back to the main question. What about exoplanets? Can we detect exoplanets? Every big telescope in the world has been pointed towards planets. Nice review paper by Joel Azio uh, at JPL, who I work closely with on this, on this topic, kind of, kind of covers the summary of all these, these kind of observations and shows that no detection, nothing so far. Um, and that's been ongoing for 30 years. I've actually got some of the deepest observations at certain frequencies. For example, here's an observation I did in uh, 2008 with what's called the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope, an, an enormous telescope in India with uh, uh, 35 dishes, each a 40 meter diameter. And they're all pointed towards the nearest hot Jupiter, well, one of the nearest hot Jupiters, uh, uh, Tau Bodas B. It's seven times closer to its parent star than even Mercury is to the sun. So really and very, very close. And you imagine it's being bombarded by an, by an intense stellar wind. What did we see? I observed it for 40 hours. And I did not see anything. <laughs> Nada. Uh, here's a light curve. I was trying to look for the pulse. And I saw nothing. What does it tell us? Not very much. Uh, that's because it's too small a sample. So it turns out it's got a uh, rotation period of 80 hours. Maybe I missed the pulse. Perhaps its magnetic field was too, uh, too weak to be detected at those frequencies. Maybe it was beaming in the other direction, right? Even with 40 hours with one of the biggest telescopes in the world, you can't make anything 
you can't make very many conclusive uh, kind of uh, comments on what, what's actually happening here. What's the most important factor is, however, on the next slide. Maybe I observed it the wrong time. Here now is a very important plot. This shows how bright the radiant emission from the Earth becomes as a function of solar wind speed. Right? And we see that by varying the solar wind speed by a factor of two or three, the Earth becomes a radio beacon. It becomes a factor of a thousand times brighter by varying just a factor of three in solar wind speed. What's happening up here? Coronal mass ejections, geomagnetic storms. If you want to capture the Earth's magnetic field or a planet's magnetic field, the best time to look is when it's being slammed by the solar wind of the star. I showed a plot earlier on of how often you expect to see those kind of storms. In the last solar cycle, there was eight. Eight times across a decade where you could see those events. So if you were point, pointing a telescope at a planet for 40 hours, well, you're not going to have much luck. We need to have the same kind of system we have uh, for, the, for the sun. We need to have a monitoring system that can monitor these systems. Look for the radio bursts from coronal mass ejections. Look for the radio emission from the aurora. Monitor them continuously. And that's really what motivated this project, because the telescope I showed you was the wrong telescope for the job. Like most big telescopes, uh, uh, this GMRT is built from very large dishes. And most big telescopes, I mean, it's iconic, seeing these big dishes that move together. They're built that way because it turns out if you want to have a lot of sensitivity, you need a lot of collecting area, OK? But bringing all those signals together and combining them is also very expensive. So it turns out to be the best, the most economical way to do this is to build big dishes and have a small number. However, big dishes have a very small field of view. The bigger the dish, the smaller the field of view. If you can build an array that has a lot of sensitivity but uses small antennas, then you can see more of the sky and monitor more systems. If you use dipoles, which can see most of the sky at any one time, and use lots and lots of them, then suddenly you can image the entire sky. So it's kind of following the track of Moore's law. Over the last 30 years, the cost of computing has got a lot cheaper. When those telescopes were all built, it was much more expensive. Now it's more feasible to get lots of small dipoles and bring them together and build a very sensitive telescope, but that now sees a lot more of the sky. And we wanted to go bring this kind, of, this kind of thread to a logical conclusion and build a telescope that can see all the sky all the time. And that's, the, that's what we call the Owens Valley LWA. It's called the Owens Valley LWA because it's built at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, which is about four and a half hours drive north of here. Uh, those of you that saw the movie The Man of Steel, Superman, uh, may recognize it because it was the home of Superman in one of the scenes, apparently. So here's The Man of Steel himself. Didn't see him when I visited there last, though. OK, so the story of building this array kind of started in 2012 when I first arrived. Um, I had the idea of building the array, but we didn't have the tools to build it. Um, uh, Deborah Castleman and, and Harold Rosen joined me at the site in 2012. And we actually built a single dipole as a demonstrator. And uh, uh, it was really exciting. Uh, we, we, we talked about what we could do, what we could build, what, what, what science it could do. And it won't just do exoplanet science. It can also do cosmology. It can also observe the sun. And uh, uh, based on that visit, uh, uh, Deborah and Harold actually gave us a small contribution that initially got the whole project kicked off. And that kind of snowballed into a much bigger project, allowed us to get institutional funds, federal funds, and we've, we've really grown from there. Uh, here is actually a photograph. This is the biggest dish on site, which is a 40-meter telescope. And uh, uh, Deborah decided that she wanted to climb up the top of that, of that dish. So this is a photograph here that I took while terrified, standing somewhere up here on a, on a ladder with no uh, harness uh, uh, as she climbed to the top. So it was a, it was a, it was a fun visit. <laughs> so based on that initial kind of motivation, um, uh, Tony Reedhead, the director of Owens Valley, and myself and others kind of put together a collaboration. And I'm not going to go through everyone's name because there's too many names here, but it's really a big collaboration that got involved in the project. Uh, Caltech at the observatory, at JPL, at Bajolazio et al., but also using other groups and other institutes. There's a collaboration called LIDA who wanted to build the electronics for a large telescope, just like we wanted to build. And they, they contributed their uh, electronics, and then another collaboration gave us their antenna, so for very low cost, we pulled it all together. So uh, here is the very first antenna we built in 2013, with a, which was a student trip, March 8th. Uh, over that three days, we built about 60 antennas. Uh, 
But the real work was done by the staff at Owens Valley. There's a fantastic staff there who can solve any problem. Uh, Caltech, I, I really think, is the field of dreams. Any idea you have, there is the expertise somewhere to do it, on campus or at the observatory. It's like, my, it's like I, I, I think of it as the technical safety blanket for any you know, crazy idea that, that might, might surface. OK, so the antennas are actually really easy to build. They're uh, single dipoles, takes you know, three students, in this case, three undergrads who are strong-armed to come down to build it for, you know, in 15 minutes. They're very strong, however. This is the same antenna 10 minutes later. So we had this idea that we'd, you know, I wanted to find a way to motivate the students to build more antennas. So I said, let's, let's have a competition. Let's have three groups, and each group can compete to build the most antennas. So that seemed like a good idea, because we got lots of antennas built. But in the end, the Owens Valley staff had to rebuild half of them, because good, good for motivation, bad for quality control. <laughs> All of the electronics that power this, that, that are behind this telescope, that's the, you know, the, the, the antennas are cheap. But we take all those cables back and put big electronics behind it. This is, the, uh, this is actually uh, a uh, shipping container given to the project by uh, Tony Reedhead that we converted to electronic shelter. It's got this massive uh, HVAC unit, and it can accommodate 50 kilowatts of electronics. Inside that, we have all our electronics. And here now are some of the students and postdocs putting it all together. Here are two of the graduate students who are doing their PhD in the project. They wired every single antenna through this, uh, this wall here. And that took a long time. There were some strong wrists after that. OK, here now is all those cables wired up. And at the heart, at the heart of, the, of the telescope, we've got uh, uh, a lot of electronics. And in particular, we have this instrument called LIDA. LIDA is a project led by Lincoln Greenhill and Harvard to build the biggest correlator in terms of number of antennas uh, for any radio telescope on the planet. And how he and his group did that is using uh, FPGA boards, but more importantly, using commercial gaming uh, processing units, GPUs. So your laptop is very good at doing Facebook, and simultaneously, uh, maybe you want to use MATLAB or whatever else. It's, it's versatile. But that versatility comes at a price. It's not very efficient at what it does. If you wanted to build a perfect CPU, you could design a CPU for a certain task. GPUs are in between. They're designed for gaming, and it just so happens they're very good at certain tasks, like multiplying numbers together which is what we're doing for these antennas. We've got thousands and thousands of numbers we want to apply together. So LIDA was built in a, in a space of a couple of weeks by Lincoln's group. Leading the effort on the ground actually was a postdoc called Jonathan Koch, uh, who's uh, now at JPL, but he, he, he got it all done very efficiently. Behind that big fire hose of data from LIDA is what we call the All Sky Transient Monitor, another big cluster. And it takes in the images, the data from LIDA and makes images. And it's a fire hose of data. 27 terabytes a day of data comes down those, those, uh, uh, down those CPUs. And it's a, it's a very challenging problem. OK, the last few slides now are going to show what we've, we've, we finally have. We're building the array in three stages. Stage one, we built the core, which consists of 256 antennas inside a 200 meter diameter area, underneath which we have 88 kilometers of uh, cable and on top of which we have now built 256 antennas. This is a satellite image, obviously. At the south end, we have our shelter, which has uh, all the electronics. And there in inside, we have deployed now all our, our, our computing. Here is an aerial video to give you an idea of the scale of the array. This is with a drone. Uh, and you can kind of get an idea. This is just the core. This is the, first, the inner 200 meters of the array. Uh, and here we have a bunch of students, very tired after a day building antennas. So the actual full array is a factor of 10 times larger in diameter. So here now is the very first light image we made from the array. Very impressive, right? <laughs> Believe it or not, we were very excited when we saw this image. It might not seem like much, but it really, we were very excited. This was the first light image we made with the core when we built it, after stage one. These are the two brightest sources in the sky. This is a supernova remnant. This is the nearest active galaxy. This is the galactic plane. You can barely see. This is the horizon, north, south, east, and west. So that was our first attempt. We, it got better, I promise. You'll see more. Uh, stage two. So that gave us our first batch of antennas. But if you want to make higher resolution images, you need longer baselines. 
The difficulty was, uh, when you go to longer baselines, you can't use cable anymore. We had to switch to optical fiber. So we, we actually pulled uh, 40 kilometers of optical fiber through conduit across the desert and put 32 new sites there for stage two. Uh, that was very difficult to do. Once again, the Owens Valley staff jumped in and, and were just very creative. They built from an old army surplus tractor uh, what they call the abomination. You can see it here. That's what they used to drag conduit through the ground and then pull fiber through that. So very creative. The biggest issue we had, however, was that op if you want to use optical fiber, you need to have fiber links that convert your signal to optical fiber, compliant signal uh, to optical, and uh, that's very expensive. Typically $2,000 per antenna. But uh, my main collaborator at Caltech, who kind of builds all the hardware, is Sandy Weinrib, uh, who's a very famous builder of radio instrumentation. And he jumped in as usual, and rather than having to pay $2,000 per antenna, he bought lots of components online, and he built these custom-made fiber links that now cost less than $100 per antenna. So it saved a huge amount of money. Uh, and he did it all for free, by the way. It was, it was spectacular. Uh, here are me and some of the students uh, now digging trenches and installing uh, these last 32 antennas. This is Ryan, and Michael, and Marin, who are doing their PhDs in the project. And we finished stage two, and stage two was where we're starting our science. Stage three, we'll finish in the next year, and we're going to put 64 more antennas. We already have all the optical fiber in the ground. It's actually not a huge step but it's going to extend out to greater baselines, out to 2.6 kilometers. This is another drone shot that shows the observatory and all the uh, signal paths across the observatory. And here now is an image of the sky with the expanded LWA. That's a nine second snapshot with the entire sky. All, there's about 2,000 sources in, the, in, that, in that snapshot. Most of those sources are not visible to the, to the, to the naked eye. Uh, they're mostly radio galaxies. Uh, here we have the galactic plane, not in the direction of the galactic center, but facing out. So these are all supernova remnants. So now we can get thousands of sources at a time uh, and, and monitor that continuously. Zooming in a little bit gives you an indication of how many sources we get per image. Uh, right now we get about 2,000 sources per image. With stage three, we'll be up to about 40, 40 or 50,000 sources per image. Uh, here is a brand new movie uh, that shows what uh, the array is capable of. This movie was made, this data, we, we took our first three days of data with the expansion pretty recently, and one of the students, Maureen Anderson, has been working uh, pretty much around the clock for the last uh, couple of days to make this movie. Uh, it's, it's a very large movie, so hopefully it'll run okay, but it shows now the galactic plane rotating over the array over the course of four hours. So all these sources you can kind of see here, these are all supernova remnants, these are all galaxies that are out here. Uh, and if you, you can kind of see here, this is a little black dot in here. Uh, this guy here is the moon. Uh, the moon is a dark spot because it blocks the bright galaxy behind us. Uh, you see lots of variability. Some, some of that variability is due to airplanes flying overhead. So you'll see a source like that pass overhead. That's because someone's TV in Las Vegas is bouncing a signal, or sorry, a TV station in Las Vegas is bouncing a signal, hits the bottom of the plane, then lands in our array. So we have a free radar system, uh, passive radar. Uh, China Lake is due south of us, so I won't say what we see from there. Um, we also see, you see little flashes. A lot of that is also due to meteors. Those meteors burn up in our atmosphere, and the ionized trail will reflect radio waves. A lot of the variability you see is because it's due to the ionosphere. The ionosphere is above the array, and is distorting everything we see. We've got to correct for that. We're working with a group at JPL who are the world's experts in ionospheric science. So that gives you an idea of what we're capable of with the array. I'm going to move on from this movie, which is going very slowly, and uh, show another movie, just for a minute. OK. This movie um, is the opposite side of the sky 12 hours later. That's a big plane flying overhead. Uh, and once again, you can see, you can see the, the sky, but watch this source. Something happens. This is our very first 24 hours of observing, by the way. It starts getting brighter and brighter, and then suddenly, bam, it increases by a factor of 1,000. That's the sun, and it's having a coronal mass ejection. <laughs> so we're, you're seeing a type 2 burst. And what was really beautiful was that with the new expansion, we can resolve that CME. This is the, the images from... Uh, uh, Soho of that event, uh, spaced by uh, about an hour, 
This is the sun. We can actually resolve the sun. We resolve the corona. This has never been done before. These frequencies, uh, and then suddenly this burst happens. You can see the CME in space yet because it's behind the coronagraph, but we see it. From here to here, it's, got about a, it's, it's about a, uh, 500 times brighter. And we can actually trace now this ejector as it, as it pops out. Of course, the real science goal is to try and find CMEs around other stars and trying to find those uh, planets when they produce their aurora. And that's our, our main goal. We've taken our first three days of data. We're uh, essentially on top of, we're, 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 that's, our, that's our first science batch of data. We're doing all our first papers with that, with that data. But then we switch it on, I think, hopefully after that, full time in our search for planets. We actually have both radio and optical coverage. This is a new project just funded by the Research Corporation to combine the radio emission to try and detect the uh, CMEs and optical uh, all-sky monitor or close to all-sky monitor to try and get the flares from the same stars. Now we can do both together. So we're going to make light curves of the nearest 3,000 stars continuously. When they're, above, when they're above the horizon, we'll monitor them continuously, looking for those events. My last two slides will show what we see for the future. And the future is to you know, take this array and build on it. Build a much larger array in a nearby valley that can image with much higher resolution and find a lot more planets. And my final slide is where I see this eventually going in the next 50 years, and hopefully a lot sooner. As I mentioned, the only planet we can detect from the ground is Jupiter. All those smaller planets, uh, their fields are too weak. If you want to get those planets, eventually we've got to build an array in space. This is a concept being developed by Joe Lazio JPL that came out of a uh, workshop that we had, the KISS workshop, Keck Institute for Sp of Space Studies, which investigated how we try and find magnetic fields on planets that are much smaller. And the idea is to put a constellation of, of CubeSats out there and combine their signals to make images of the sky. And I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>